you actually need a, a reasonable area of a sound absorbing finish to make a significant difference to the level. So the best way to do that is to get it in when, you, when you're building and fitting out your space um, because it's very difficult to do it in a way that is um, aligned with your fit out and with your design intent once it's built. Um, but it doesn't add a whole lot of cost in the initial fit out. Anyone who's been to Ren, the new Melbourne restaurant from the Nomad Group, has a lot to say about it. They usually start with the incredible space. The restaurant is in a cathedral-like old stock exchange building that dates to the 1890s. They talk about the cocktails, the seafood, the steak, and personally, I'm still thinking about the cheese. But they also talk about the acoustics. How is it possible in this soaring stone chamber that you can hear yourself think, let alone have conversations? Today, we're talking to the woman who can answer that question. Helen Searle is an acoustic, audiovisual and theatre consultant within the Arup Melbourne team. Helen, welcome to Daddy Linen. Thank you. Nice to be here. Great to have you on the show. I mean, let's get stuck into Ren. Why does it sound okay in there? (laughs) Because they hired an acoustic consultant. (laughs) Um, But, I mean, in terms of the what's actually happening with the architecture and the acoustics, um, they've got some secret acoustic panelling built into the architectural design. Um, We... We had to be really, really considerate with the building, um, given that it's a heritage listed space, about how we could actually um, get some what we call sound absorbing finishes uh, within the space. Um, uh, Built, <laughs> sorry, um, fixed within the architecture, and then also look within the fit out and look for opportunities where we could get some sound absorbing finishes. So um, it does look like it hasn't been touched and it's this grand cathedral space, but there are a lot of finishes in that space doing um, some really good hard work to enable um, a comfortable acoustic environment. And I mean, you mentioned that they hired an acoustic engineer, which, you know, clearly not every restaurant does or is in a position to do or may think is necessary. I mean, stepping back a bit from the particulars of this job, what what does your work involve? Um, so the main way I like to describe my role is really in two parts. So either what I'm doing is looking to enhance wanted sounds in spaces. So if you think about a concert hall, um, I'm working to make sure that every little sound from the violinist on stage can be heard by a member of the audience um, and that they get a very um, immersive and equal experience no matter where they're sitting within that concert hall. So that's all about enhancing wanted sound. Um, The other big piece is about mitigating unwanted noise as we kind of switch switch from sound to noise. That's really about it being unwanted. So um, that could be noise from mechanical services. That could be noise from um, an underground rail line, which is passing underneath your building. That could be noise from a wind turbine um, if you're out in regional Victoria. Uh, but it could be as simple as noise from other diners within a restaurant, um, you know, impacting your ability to have that conversation across the table with the people that you're you're at the restaurant with. I mean, it, it's, I've seen like, you know, shadow plans for building design, but how do you, come, how do you come up with the audio design for a space? I mean, every space is so different. And as you've described, you know, the requirements of spaces, uh, the purpose of the people entering them is always different. Like, how do you go about mapping this all out? Um, it really depends kind of based on what field we're working in, but um For example, for kind of a traditional building, um, what we'll be looking at is um, the existing noise environment at the site. So, you know, um, say we're building an apartment, it's by a rail line. What we'll do is we'll go out and we'll measure the noise levels there. We'll understand what the existing environment is. 
Um, and then we'll look at, we'll be working with the facade engineer or the architect to say, if you build this facade, this is um, the level that you'll get inside your apartment. And those levels can be dictated either by Australian standards or, um, or it might be in consultation with the client um, in terms of what they feel is an, ex- is an acceptable level, um, or it could just be kind of our knowledge and our best practice. Um, so for this project in particular, um, Al and Rebecca, the owners, you know, they're very tapped into what makes a good restaurant. They've done this before. They, um, they care a lot about it. And so we actually used um, the space that we have in our Arab office called the Sound Lab. Um, and that enables us to essentially create, create a 3D um, audio recording um, for playback that they can hear and understand what it might sound like with different interventions. Um, and this is especially good when you have quite, you know, an atypical space because you can't just say, oh, you know, pop on down to this restaurant, have a listen. This is what they've done. What do you think about it? Um, when when you're trying to put a restaurant into a cathedral, there's not a lot of those to go and visit. So um, we use what's called oralization. It's essentially the oral version of visualization. So we create this acoustic environment um, that's that's built from a um, 3D acoustic modeling and also some on-site testing. Um, and then we can play through some different scenarios and they can say, absolutely not, that's horrible. We cannot operate a restaurant um, in that condition or, yep, this is sounding really good and this is really comfortable. And we kind of use that as our basis of design to then look at what do we need to do architecturally um, to ensure we can actually get you know, get those noise levels and and that acoustic environment. Wow, that's so interesting. And the technology just sounds incredible. I mean, conversation, conversation isn't just one thing. I mean, conversation with 40 people, uh, at, at 12 o'clock on a, on a Monday for business lunch is very different to, you know, 80 people on a Friday night where, let's say, 40% of them have had two glasses of wine and a cocktail. Like, how do you – do you have a sort of conversational models that replicate the different potential scenarios? We do. Um, it's – it, that's actually the trickiest thing with restaurant acoustics um, and with just crowd noise in general. So the input to our modeling that we did for Sound Lab used a bunch of different white papers. Um, so there's one um, written by an author called Hain, and they actually focus on um, like noise and beer gardens. So that gives you that kind of like potentially alcohol fueled. Um, bit more rowdy <laughs> um, crowd where you're, you're just less aware of your impact on others and your impact on um, the acoustic environment that you're in. Um, but also there's a lot of studies around um, uh, the, the what's called the cocktail party event, oh, sorry, cocktail party effect, um, which actually helps you to simulate how um, – people sorry uh so the Lombard effect it it allows you to um understand that feedback loop because if you're in a space that's loud you will raise your voice in order to be heard above the the noise the background sound and that babble within that space and so if everyone starts raising their voices what happens is it gets louder and louder and louder and louder so that is built into um the acoustic modeling that we've done and and we kind of tested some different scenarios like restaurant operating at capacity or, um, you know, a quieter lunchtime in order to um, give Rebecca and Al um, a sense of how the space might sound. Yeah, right. It's so fascinating. And I mean, how do you, how satisfied are you with the job that you've done? And and when you go in there and listen to it, are, are there any particular elements that you're really proud of that you're like, oh yeah, this was a bit of a puzzler, but yeah, we really nailed it by putting that thing over there. Yeah. Um, I think it sounds great. I was really scared <laughs> um, about how it might sound. I mean, we've, you know, we have all this theoretical basis, but like you said, there's so much subjectivity in how someone actually reacts in a space. 
Um, I think something that really works in our benefit, and I, I have, you know, I can't claim this, but it, it has this grand, almost like spiritual quality just from the the architecture, the heritage architecture, and that demands a level of respect. So I think as a baseline, people go in there and they kind of have this kind of um, sense of awe and they they would generally speak with a slightly lowered voice um, and, and potentially because the space is so open and they can see, you know, other tables, they sort of, people do react to that um, and you get this kind of psychological acoustic response um, which is which is helping us. Um, but I think to kind of answer what I'm most proud of, I think getting um, an acoustic finish that was respectful of the of the heritage fabric. Um, so what we did was we actually worked with um, Ortex Acoustics. So they um, produce acoustic paneling, and we knew that they could do these custom printed um, panels. And so through consultation with Al and with the architectural team and with Ortex, um, we kind of came up with this scheme to enable those panels to be inserted into the um, the niches on the walls of the heritage um, building. And they actually have a print that matches the existing brickwork. So you don't even notice them when you're in there. Um, and so it's this super respectful acoustic overlay um, in the heritage uh, on the heritage fabric and I, I'm really proud of that because I don't want to be an acoustic designer that dictates how the architecture looks. I really want to make sure that what I'm doing is focusing on how the, the space feels and how it sounds without having um, the ar- you know the architectural intent completely destroyed. I mean, how do you, I guess, you know, pr- what's the proof of your work? Like, do you go back in there with a um, like some kind of measuring equipment and and check the decibels at, in different circumstances? Like, how do you sort of validate your work? Um, it really depends on kind of what our client wants and and what we're scoped for. So, on this project, you know, really the proof of the work is these these responses back from the owners and back from the people that go to the space and they say it's great. Right, like they don't need a number to prove that. They, you know, they get that within the experience. Um, for something that is much, you know, for a different type of building that there might be like a code or a standard that they have to meet, we would we would typically go back and and do measurements within the space um, to verify that we have met that code or standard. Um, in saying that, we are going to go back. Um, I've, I'm booking them with Al to do some um, measurements and recordings during a um, during like a busy night of service, so that we can actually verify our acoustic modelling and use that for our own research and understanding for future projects to inform, you know, the way that we consider uh, all this theory that's been built into um, the design. Mm, incredible. So, I mean, uh, Al and Rebecca were clearly pretty well resourced to invest in all the different things that they invested in at Ren, and you know, thank goodness they were because it's um, certainly you can see it pays off in the in the experience. Um, but obviously, a lot of restaurateurs are not in such a position. Like when you go into a restaurant and you're, and you're like, oh, my goodness, I cannot have a conversation here. What sorts of things do you look around and see that people could do that perhaps aren't that expensive, don't require a whole lot of measurement? Like, is it possible to improve the acoustics without um, bringing in the experts? Absolutely. Um, I... I've actually been approached a lot of times from people, you know, that have small bars and restaurants and they ask me for kind of ad hoc advice. And to be honest, I'm more than happy to just give them a few (laughs) um, tips here and there to help them on their way. Um, A few things that I always say um, is you actually need a, a reasonable area of a sound absorbing finish to make a significant difference to the level. So the best way to do that is to get it in when you when you're building and fitting out your space um, because it's very difficult to do it in a way that is um, aligned with your fit out and with your design intent once it's built. Um, but it doesn't add a whole lot of cost in the initial fit out. 
So concentrating on getting a large area, typically the ceiling is the best place for that because functionally in a restaurant, a lot of the surfaces need to be hard. Um, so you'll even see it at Rain and LaRue, um, you know, the, the floors are timber, uh, the, the tables don't have tablecloths. Um, you need those surfaces, those functional surfaces to be functional and cleanable and safe for the people working there. So you've got to look at where you can actually get um, a sort of spongy sound absorbing material. And typically the ceiling is the best place for that. Um, it's great if you can get some local sound absorbing finishes at head height. Um, so again, uh, in the cathedral room, um, you'll see that there's the perforated timber paneling in the uh, in the banquettes, and there's actually a, a sound absorbing finish built in behind that. It doesn't need to be something custom and timber and perforated. It needs to be something that absorbs sound, um, and really, that's kind of a, typically like a little spongy material. Often, people want to put a finish in front of it, um, just f- so it's hard wearing and um, so that it looks okay. Um, but you want to get some local sound absorbing finishes. Some other kind of critical pieces are think about your table size. If you make your tables really wide, people have to speak at a louder level, even to the people that they are there with. If you just bring them closer together, they can lower their voice and communicate um, better. So that can make a huge difference. Um, big round tables, disaster. Narrow, narrower tables, so much better for that intimate and lower level um, conversation. Um, you want to think about table placement. So again, if you think about um, somewhere like Chin Chin, which is very loud and they love it, they want it to be loud, so that's great for them. Um, those tables are so close together that you almost feel like you're having a conversation with the person at the table next to you um, and you're there's very little you can do to control the acoustic environment if someone is directly next to someone because the the sound you're hearing is not an artifact of the room. It's an artifact of their voice coming straight to your ears. <laughs> so thinking about how you can lay out your tables in a way that you can get some buffers between people, um, just give them a little bit of space. And I know that obviously the more tables you get in your restaurant or bar, you know, the more money. So, so that's a contentious one for people, but um, it is really important. And then I think the other piece would be thinking about other noisy activities. So where's your bar? Have you got people shaking cocktails? Is that right next to, you know, the area that you want people to be having a really intimate conversation? Because that background sound is going to mean that they have to raise their voice Um, have you got an open kitchen is there any way that you can provide some buffer between the open kitchen and your diners just to mean that that background sound is just that little bit lower and people don't have to raise their voices Uh, and then I think this is more for I guess site selection but think about your ceiling height Um, often big volumes um, can be quite tricky for acoustics because it means there's more volume for that kind of babble to build up in but in a restaurant setting it can actually be really helpful because you don't get the direct reflection of sound off the ceiling and over to the next diner Um, and that's something that really works in our favor in the cathedral room as well because there's so much volume for that sound to kind of um, escape up into and and almost sort of reverberate and and, and um, smooth out above your head and not right in by your ears and <laughs> being distracting. It's a very different texture of sound. So if you can get a higher ceiling, um, it's great. So I think those are uh, the things I typically tell people. <laughs> it's, it's a lot. So, so, but it's so helpful. Um, and of course, you know, not everyone can fit out a space from scratch, but it sounds like some of those things, like the ceiling acoustics and perhaps thinking about table size, it, even those, those kinds of tweaks could be done when you're in a space that's already fitted out, couldn't they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. 
Yeah. Um, it's interesting thinking about Chin Chin and places that love to be loud. I, I, um, not hospo related, but I, one of the most extraordinary oral experience I've had recently was being at a footy final at the MCG, 94,000 people there. And the noise was just uh, remarkable um, towards the end of the game. I mean, do you, do you think stadium design it thinks about acoustics or is it just a function of when you've got that many people, the roar is going to be roaring? Um, it is typically considered. Um, it's not always considered in terms of like, how can we make this space, you know, have, have a signature or have that roar. But um, it is something that comes up and it depends again on like how much money <laughs> whoever's building this thing has to, um, yeah, to pour into it. Um, we, so at Arup we have the way that our, the way that our organization is set up is we have, it's all employee owned and some of the profits from um, our project work gets fueled back into research. So some of the things I was mentioning in terms of, you know, us going out and measuring and, and recording once the space is open, that can get funded by our internal research to enable us to kind of learn more going forward. And I know um, there's been a lot of research done with an Arab around this um, stadium acoustics because there are certain stadiums in the world, or stadia, I guess is the word, uh, where people really say like it's so loud and it gives you this massive home team advantage. And, and yeah, it, it is something that is studied, I think, maybe not implemented that much in practice, uh, but it could be. <laughs> wow. Yeah, really interesting. I think – yeah, then you'd think like if they, the team builds a stadium, then do they have to come up with a chant or a song that works in it and, you know, it becomes this Mexican wave type effect but with sound. Um, it's, yeah, a really a really fascinating area and, and something that I think, um, you know, we love to think about restaurants and, and hospitality venues in a really 360 way on this podcast, but I think this is something we haven't talked about much before. But it's so important to the dining experience. I know that I can't invite my parents to a restaurant that's too noisy because they'll just be sitting there frustrated. Um, so, yeah, do you, I mean, do you feel like overall there is more attention being given to this or do you do you dine out in frustration all the time? <laughs> um I don't think there's much attention being given to it, to be honest. Um, but interestingly, when I tell people I'm an acoustic consultant and I explain what my job is, restaurants are the number one thing that they will mention because it's something that a lot of people experience on a daily basis. Um, or, sorry, not a daily basis, but a weekly or whatever, monthly basis, especially in Melbourne. Um, and people often say, similar to what you've said, you know, I can't take my parents there or, you know, I have difficulty hearing, so I just couldn't go back to that place. Um, I would love to see more emphasis placed on it. Um, but as we discussed earlier, you know, a lot of these people starting out and, and opening small restaurants, you know, they've got limited budgets. And <laughs> mostly when people are uh, recording things for Instagram and promoting their business, they're not going to have the audio on because, you know, having audio <laughs> of a restaurant, it's not really enticing or exciting for people. You know, they're so focused on like, how does this look and how can we bring this vibe that's going to want, like, that's going to draw people in. Um, but I think it is really, really important for, for those people starting out to consider the acoustics because, while it might not be the thing that draws someone in, it's going to be the thing that brings people back. I think that's, yeah, really well said. And I think also for staff, it's really key. I mean, I know that a lot of people that um, work in kitchens end up with something that's approaching industrial deafness simply because of being around um, machinery and the clattering and, 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 and yeah, just the sounds of a kitchen. But it must be the same for, um, for front of house staff. Uh, it must be quite exhausting to be working in somewhere where you're always having to shout at your co-workers um, and strain to hear customers when they communicate with you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and um, there have been studies. There's, there's a great paper um, 
it's pretty old now, but it's all about like the the noise levels of restaurants um, across New York City, and it studies those levels and and basically the standard noise level in those restaurants is exceeding an oh and s standard when you look at it from like an eight hour shift perspective so it is actually a safety issue um and i don't think people think about it from that perspective really at all yeah that's really interesting um but i yeah you just would never see on a job ad for a restaurant you know uh, we fried ourselves on a, a a workplace that um doesn't yeah, isn't too loud. You just, I just have never seen that. But it would be interesting um, if people started using their attention to acoustics as a as a selling point, not only for customers but also for staff. For sure. Mm. I guess one point to come back to, um, kind of men- mentioning the chin chins and the the restaurants that. Um, are kind of desi- designed to be loud. Um, one thing that actually comes up a lot when when someone who's opening a restaurant or like you know pull me in for a casual conversation, there there's this fear of not having the space feel lively. Like oh, but what if we treat all the all the surfaces and then it feels really like awkward and dead in there? You know that like you f- you feel like you're inside. I don't know, a box full of cotton wool. Um, And my response to that is I have never (laughs) experienced a restaurant uh, with acoustic treatment that feels that way because you're so limited with where you can actually put the finishes um, just from a functionality perspective that there's no risk that you're going to end up in this um, like cotton wool environment within your restaurant just by putting some sound absorbing finishes on your ceiling or even some kind of local treatment. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I, I guess people need to trust that they can create an atmosphere <laughs> that still um, yeah, is conducive to conversation. I mean, I guess, as you say, you've, you can't have um, yeah, spongy floors and spongy tabletops. So uh, it's probably going to, yeah, it's probably going to work out OK. Um, Helen, it's such an interesting area. I'm so glad um, and grateful to you for your time and your expertise and sharing with us today. Such useful tips for people. We love coming away with those actionable outcomes. Thanks so much for what you've done at REN, first of all, but also for chatting to us today on Dirty Linen. Really appreciate it. Thanks. It's my pleasure. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you. This.